Welcome to the Carrie Newhoff Leadership Podcast on YouTube. My name is Carrie Newhoff, and my goal is to help you lead like never before. So what I do every week is I sit down with world-class leaders and church leaders, business leaders, and I talk to them about what made them who they are and try to have the conversation with them that you would have if you got to sit down for lunch with them or have dinner with them or really got to spend some time with them. So we go into the backstory and we explore what made them who they are and some of the principles they've learned along the way. So if you enjoy this episode, I would love for you to like it, to subscribe, and also to share it with your friends. And in the meantime, here's today's episode. David, welcome to the podcast. Man, it's uh, such a pleasure to be with you. I've been a fan of yours for a long time, and it's great anytime we can connect and talk, and especially right now. Well, especially right now, yeah. And I know you and I have had a chance to interview each other at events and conferences, but first time on the podcast. So really thrilled that we were finally able to make it happen. So very few leaders today have a lifelong career at a company, mm. um, but you're one of those fortunate people. So Chick-fil-A for how many years? Was it 37? 37 years, yeah. Wow, that's a long time. So mm. you were 12 when you started. <laughs> tell, <laughs> tell, us, tell, us what, tell us what happened. Like how, yeah. how did you get into Chick-fil-A? Well, Carrie, I met Truett Cathy when I was a junior in college. And uh, I ended up going to work for him four hours after college graduation. I literally started on a Saturday morning, went to work for Chick-fil-A four hours later. Uh, How did that happen? So you you literally walk off a stage and go to (laughs) Chick-fil-A. Really, it did because they they were doing a little training program that had started that week and I'd missed all the training. So I was trying to get there to catch up as quickly as I could. And uh, but here's what's fascinating is Chick-fil-A at the time. It wasn't a startup, but it was close. Uh, it was a converted air freight warehouse. There were about 20 or 25 people on the staff and they'd run out of room in the warehouse. So they cut a hole through the wall, pulled up a mobile home. And my first office was in a mobile home attached to a warehouse. And literally you walk through the hole in the wall to get to it. And, uh, Uh, so that was the, the humble beginnings, but what makes it miraculous almost is if I go back to what I was thinking about as a 21 year old, if you'd asked me as a 21 year old, what the most remarkable life I could imagine consisted of, it would have been to uh, graduate from college, make as much money as I can, as fast as I can to retire as early as I can. And I had set 35 as my goal, uh, retire at 35. Seriously. Well, you know, that's a whole movement now, right? The fire movement, (laughs) financial independence, retire early, but you were way ahead of the curve on that. Well, what makes it fascinating is I share that today with like college students and all of them are shaking their head and everyone thinks that's, you know, the most amazing thing. How cool would it be? But I look back on it now and I think that was a really bad idea. Hmm. In fact, you know, instead of finding the job I could retire from early and let's unpack that just for a minute. If you're hoping, Goal is to retire early, then what that basically says is you're not enjoying what you're doing because your goal is to stop doing it as quick as you can. So even if you accomplish it, let's say you retire by 35, essentially you spent 15 years in misery, mm-hmm. something else. And then the question becomes, what do you do with the rest of your life? So uh, what, what I found at Chick-fil-A, Kerry, was something that I never would have imagined existed, something that had never crossed my mind. Something that had you told me about it as a 21 year old, I wouldn't have believed it. But I got to see it play out in front of my very eyes and I got to experience it and live it. And that's the only reason I believe it. Instead of finding the job I could retire from early, I found the job I wouldn't want to retire from. Yeah. See, that thought had never crossed my mind that there could be a job you wouldn't want to retire from. Uh, you know, we're taught that, thank God it's Friday. We're taught to you know, that, that work is something to be endured, not endearing. And we're taught, uh, you know, culturally we think work is something to be avoided. It's a dirty four letter word almost. What I found was work when it's executed well is something that can be rewarding, something that can be enriching, something that can be looked forward to. It's all the opposite of what I was thinking. And work can be something you wouldn't want to retire from. What would you say, David, are the qualities and characteristics, whether that's at Chick-fil-A or just that you've seen in the industry or in in business or churches or organizations? Because I get what you're saying. Like, I I could retire right now. I mean, but I don't want to. I love waking up doing this. What what are the ingredients? Because you're right. So many people hate their job. It's something to be endured. We work for the weekend. We got off early. We don't want to do this anymore. We dream of a hammock and a beach. So what is it that kept you coming back? 
Yeah. Well, I think, you know, Truett introduced me to the idea that if you love what you do, you'll never work another day in your life. Right. So I feel like I spent 37 years at Chick-fil-A, never worked a day in my life. But that thought had never occurred to me. But kind of in retrospect, I'll share with you what I shared with the team that I worked with at Chick-fil-A. And by the way, you know, when I started with Chick-fil-A, there were two of us in that mobile home. There was a gentleman named Steve Robinson. Hmm. who They had hired in January of my senior year to start a marketing department. And then I got hired in June. So at one point, it was the two of us were the marketing department at Chick-fil-A. When I left Chick-fil-A, we had 300 people in the marketing department. So we grew and we grew from, you know, a, a multi-million dollar business to a multi-billion dollar business, you know, over time. But, but here's what I told them when yeah. I was looking back on it. I said, this is what to me would be important. I said, you need four things for the job you wouldn't want to retire from. One is you want to love what you do. Second, you want to love who you're doing it with. You want to love the mission that you're on. And you want to love who you're becoming in the process of accomplishing that mission. If you can have those four things, you know, then you will have the job you wouldn't want to retire from. I'm I'm getting ready to interview Seth Godin. So I want to go back to the first thing you said, because you're like, love what you do. And Seth Godin says the axiom today is the opposite. It's do what you love. In other words, find something you love and then do that. But, But you've kind of flipped it around. And you're saying, no, 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 you have to love what you do. So you're in a marketing position. What are the ingredients? And you've listed the other three, but I I think that's a really good distinction. And I wanted to make sure we have a ton of young listeners, uh, young leaders listening. It is very counterintuitive to what's out there in the water supply right now. Mm -hmm. So what made you love working in the marketing job at Chick-fil-A? Well, I'll answer that. But before I do, I want to add one thing that I think would be super helpful because I've heard it said you should love what you do and that's necessary, but not sufficient for a career. Hmm. So I think there's another dimension to it that most people miss. So you could love what you do. And let's just say, Carrie, that you're an amazing skateboarder. You know, you're a super talented skateboarder. You're being imagination. Thing. It's, yeah, yeah. You know, and, uh, and you love it. Now that's great. If you can, if you can create value for other people, through skateboard. Like if you can fill up stadiums or if ESPN wants to film you and sell commercials, if you can do that, that's a great career. But if if it's just you who love what you do and you're the only beneficiary of loving what you do, then that's a great hobby for you. A terrible career because careers are about creating value for other people. So the second half of that is yes, you should love what you do, but yes, for it to be a career, you got to create value for other people. Because that's what you get paid for is not, you don't get paid to love what you do. You get paid to create value for other people. And if in the context of creating value for other people, you love what you do, that's the job you wouldn't want to retire from. So I think that dimension is what gets lost in the conversation is the point of a career is not to extract value for yourself is to create value for other people. That That dimension doesn't get talked about enough. Hmm. So you're straight out of college, literally. Yes. What did Truett see in you, do you think, as a young leader? (laughs) I have no idea, but I'm so glad he did because I never would have expected, you know, when I graduated from college, I I was taught you're going to have 9.2 jobs over the course of your career and wherever you start to be your first, you know, I never thought I would be there for 37 years. I never thought it would grow into what it became. Um, but, but here's a fascinating conversation that I had that might again, help your listeners, especially the younger ones. Uh, again, my mindset, uh, as a 21 year old was, I want to go out and make as much money as I can fast. I can retire as early as I can. And Chick-fil-A offered me the least amount of money of any option I had coming out of college. I, I'd done really well in college. I'd done well academically. I'd had a lot of leadership roles. I had a great resume. So, so I had a lot of really good offers coming out of school. And uh, the the smallest offer I had by 50% less than the others was Chick-fil-A. And yet I was struggling. There was something about Chick-fil-A that was interesting to me, but it didn't look like it was the best path to retire early. I had a mentor in my life uh, at the time, a guy named Dave Kaplan, and he came up to visit me. Uh, I was at University of Georgia, and I'll never forget it, Kerry. It felt like it was yesterday. He visited me in the ATO parking lot. We're sitting there and I explained all this to him. I said, you know, what my goals were and there's something about Chick-fil-A and it didn't take him a nanosecond to figure it out. He said, Salyers, 
The last thing you need to worry about coming out of college is how much money you make. Hmm. He said, there are four things. He said, find a leader you want to become more like because whoever you place yourself under as a leader, that's a picture of the future you. Or I'll, I'm going to use Truett's words on each of these. Truett used to say it this way. He said, we become like those we surround ourselves with for better or worse. Hmm. So he basically said, surround yourself with people that you want to become more like. Yep. That was number one. Number two was, he said, find a company you'd be proud to work for. Because first question you're going to get, you know, is who do you work for? And, you know, you want to have a company you'd be proud to work for. Truett's version of that was a good name is rather be chosen than great riches. And Truett was always talking about a good, that his personal good name and the good name of Chick-fil-A. And my job in many ways at Chick-fil-A was to create a good name for Chick-fil-A. So find a company with a good name, a leader you want to become more like. Third, he said, find a job you would be uniquely gifted to do. All of us have unique giftings. You know, we've got some, some real strengths and we've got some weaknesses. And, you know, find a job that plays to your strengths and that you're uniquely gifted to do. And then finally, find a job you'd be passionate about doing. Hmm. And if I think about passionate about doing, I think find a job that charges your battery, doesn't drain it. Or another dimension of passion I've kind of discovered later in life was passions in life are things we're happy to sacrifice for. Mm-hmm. You have a job you'd be happy to sacrifice for. I remember Andy Stanley one time when he was telling the story of the start of North Point Church. He said there was a point at which we financially were a little unstable. And he said, I felt like if the church uh, started to have financial problems, everyone would go out and get a part time job to keep it going. You know, that they were that dedicated. And so even in the for profit, I've got a number of for profit companies now that I'm working on, but all of them have this nonprofit mentality that we've got people that many times take a cut and pay to come work for one of these companies because they believe in the mission of what we're doing. And that was my case at Chick-fil-A. I didn't technically take a cut and pay, but I took 50% less than I could have gotten elsewhere because I believed in some things about Chick-fil-A that they were doing. And I like to think of businesses that are mission motivated, not money motivated. They're on a mission. You know, they're, they're, they've got a campaign going that's super important to them and more important than the paychecks they're getting. And so anyway, those were the four things that Dave Kaplan shared. He said, a leader you could believe in and want to become more like, a company with a good name, a, a job that you're uniquely gifted to do, and a job you'd be passionate and energized by doing. He said, if you can find those four things, he said, money will never be your problem. Hmm. Fair enough. That was like the scales fell from my eyes. I said, that's why I'm struggling with this. Chick-fil-A is all four of those things. The other jobs, not so much. So I took the job with Chick-fil-A for half what I could have made other places. And I've never looked back and it worked out pretty good <laughs> from every dimension. Uh, it's fascinating, David. I, I want to I wanna double click on money as a motivator. Because yeah. it's it's a really interesting thing. And, you know, I, I ended up in ministry for a fraction of what I would have made in law and half of what I would have made at a church in Toronto. And, you know, here we are all these years later. And um, it's true. All the studies suggest that at a certain level, yes, you need a roof over your head. Yes, you need to buy groceries, fill your car up with gas or, you know, plug in the battery or whatever you're doing. Um, but do you want to talk about when and how money stopped being your motivator? Yeah. Well, almost, right. <laughs> you know, because literally that that whole idea of retiring early was all about money and, uh, uh, you know, the love of money. And uh, the Bible talks about the fact that the love of money is the root of all kind of evil. And I think if businesses are all centered around nothing but money, it's the root of all kinds of problems. So I look for mission motivated businesses uh, to get involved with. And uh, because I feel like in the end, money is important. You can't have a business without mm-hmm. money. You got to be profitable, you know, but if that's all you have to offer, you don't have much to offer. I feel like money is the, is the starting point and money is more the way the score is kept. It's the fruit, not the object. Uh, and if you keep money as the fruit, not the object, you'll end up with a lot more money in, in my opinion. And, and in my experience is organizations where money is the fruit, not the object of what you're doing right? are the, are the great brands. You know, all the great brands that you think about out there, they're not all about money. You know, I don't know too many entrepreneurs you know, that uh, that do great things and become these great guns that their primary 
motivating force is money. It's they want to change the world. They want to create things people have never seen. They've all got a, a mission and a campaign uh, and, and, and a crusade that they're on. Mm-hmm. This so far beyond money. And I feel like the the uh, the wimpy competitors, they're the ones chasing the money. And the thought leaders and the, uh, the, the great brands, they're the ones chasing the big idea and chasing the mission and the, the campaign. And that's what I saw at Chick-fil-A. Uh, it's interesting. When I started with Chick-fil-A, uh, you know, again, I had to take a cut and pay, but probably uh, for the first, I'm going to call it 10 or 15 years of my career, almost everybody I hired took a cut and pay to come to Chick-fil-A. Wow. And what I learned during that time is there are things beyond money that motivate people. And, and that's what we had to uh, focus on. And then over time, now you'll make more money when you go to Chick-fil-A, but, but it had to start with people who came with a different motivation. And here's another real aha moment for me. There was a guy that worked with me at Chick-fil-A and he moved to another department for a couple of years and for two years. And I kept meeting with him because I'm, 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 you know, when I, hire somebody at Chick-fil-A or something. They're, they're a friend for life and they're important to me for life. And I don't care whether they work in my department or somewhere else. They are an important human being to me. So he kept coming to me during that time. And during that time, his income went to heights it had never been to at Chick-fil-A. He was making more money than he'd ever made. And he was the most miserable he'd ever been. And, and then he ended up switching back into my department later. And then he, he had the money and the other stuff. But what I realized during that episode was how could he be making the most money he's, if it's all about money and he's making more money than he's ever made, how could it be the most miserable he's ever been? That's I saw that I in think. law, yeah. uh, my brief time in law, like people yeah. who had everything and, and yet on the inside were, were not happy and, and, and had no money. Um, I would love to go back because we've had a few Chick-fil-A guests. We'll link to the previous episodes. We've had Deanne Turner and Mark Miller and others yeah. on the, on the podcast, but and Jeff Henderson, of course, who you know really, really well. Sure. Uh, Chick-fil-A was a slow start. Like everyone thinks of Chick-fil-A now, right? Almost every city in the South and now globally, you know, rolling out, et cetera, et cetera. But it, was, it wasn't there just one restaurant for the longest time. And then yeah. you must have gotten in, like it was almost like a 20-year ground floor. Can you take us back to yeah. your experience of that? Yes, I love that. That that may be the single best question you've asked me so far, Carrie. That's so important. Uh, here's what I really get excited about, and maybe your audience will. Do you know how old Truett Cathy was when he opened the first Chick-fil-A as you know it? I do not. He was 48 years old. I rounded it to 50. So basically everything you know of as Chick-fil-A happened after age 50 for Truett Cathy. For Truett. Wow. And, and so I think about him at age 48, and he had one restaurant in Hateful, Georgia called the Dwarf House Restaurant. And I keep thinking at age 48, was he thinking, is this all I had? Is this all life? You know, is this all God has for me in life? Is this all I'm going to do is one restaurant in Hateful, Georgia. And little did he know that that next year and the rest the back half of his life was really going to be what his career was all about. So the first 48 years were preparation for what he would really do in life. When did he start? How old was he when he started the, the Dwarf House? Yeah, he started, I, I don't know exactly uh, what age he was. I think it was 1946, 1947, yeah. he right after World War uh, II. He was, uh, he was in World War II. In fact, he, was, he worked in some of the kitchens and commissaries and, that, and perfected some of his culinary skills. And then after the war, he and his brother sold everything they had, including a car, to start that first restaurant. And he took up an apartment right next door. And literally he would just have to commute, you know, for one house over in the middle of the night, that first restaurant was open 24 hours a day, six days a week. And by the seventh day, that's why I decided to close Sunday. He said, I got a day off. <laughs> he was spent. <laughs> he was, yeah. he was spent. But he, uh, he built that little business. Uh, and then Chick-fil-A uh, became uh, or the Chick-fil-A sandwich became his most popular item. And the way the Chick-fil-A sandwich was created is really fascinating is chicken was his slowest item to cook. Chick- chicken would take, let's call it eight or 10 minutes and a hamburger would take two or three. So if somebody ordered those two together. The chicken would slow things down. So he started experimenting with boneless chicken. He would take the breast of chicken and he could then cook it about as fast as the hamburgers. And now he could get the orders out faster. And, th- and then, so he had this filet of chicken and then it became a sandwich. 
And then it became his most popular item. And then the first Chick-fil-A, as you know it and I know it, opened in 1967 in the Greenbrier Shopping Mall. And he had like a little 800 square foot uh, chicken sandwich stand that would sell chicken sandwiches, fries and drinks. That's all. That was his whole menu. That was the start of Chick-fil-A. And then he opened another and another and another. And the rest, as they say, is history. But for the first 20 years, Chick-fil-A was only in shopping malls. 100% of locations were in shop. When I came on board, 100% of the uh, locations were in shopping malls. Really? How many stores were there by the time you joined the company? And, and no, roughly what year was that? that? I was a 21-year-old kid not paying much attention. <laughs> <laughs> I should go back and do the research on that. I don't know exactly. But it was dozens, stores. not hundreds, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 It was not not hundreds. It was dozens, not hundreds for sure. So you're basically starting a marketing department. Yeah. What were your biggest challenges as a 21 year old, you know, walking through the hole in the wall into your, your mobile home? uh, How do you even start from scratch in marketing? Well, we, we had to form kind of a a, a philosophical approach. What what we realized is because a hundred percent of our locations at that time were in shopping malls, we conceptually d- devised this idea that we're going to be a uh, captive audience marketing firm. In other words, we weren't trying to get people to come to the mall. That was the mall's job. But once they got there, we we're going to focus on that experience and do things that would entice them to eat. And it's interesting, Carrie, for the first 10 weeks of my time at Chick-fil-A, they sent me out to 10 different locations and I had a week at each location. And my job, along with two other people that were with me, were get sales up as much as we could in one week. Do whatever you can to get sales up in one week. And we were being sent to the locations with the lowest sales, where operators you know, were focused on controlling their cost because they thought costs are controllable, but they didn't feel like sales were controllable. And mm. our job was to kind of prove to them that sales were as controllable as cost in this. Oh, wow. Year. It's good and insight. More, 10 out of 10 locations, we had sales increases, double digit, 10 out of 10. In three of the 10, we had triple digit sales increases. And what that did for this 21 year old kid was made me realize sales are controllable. I know what to do and I can do it. I did it 10 out of 10 times. So I was learning this whole idea of captive audience marketing by doing it and and experiencing the results. What did you do? Well, what, what we realized intuitively, and we later proved this statistically with data, is that 70% of eating in a mall is impulsive eating. People didn't walk into the mall thinking they were going to eat that day. They smelled something, they saw something, and all of a sudden decided to eat. So we had all kinds of things we could do, everything from sampling chicken. We, we had a little piece of sample on a, on a plate. and we right. would go Costco it. strategy, got it, <laughs> yep. It was funny. You'd see people, you'd sample to them. They walk down the mall and three minutes later, they come back. It was kind of like a Lay's potato chip. <laughs> you know, you couldn't eat just one. And then we did product demonstrations. I, I learned to juggle that summer with lemons because we have fresh squeezed lemonade. No one would believe it was fresh squeezed. So we literally get out on what we call the lease line of the mall, which is where our restaurant intersected with the mall. And we would squeeze lemons and juggle them. And people would say, wow, you really squeeze your lemons. And uh, we'd make pies, uh, all kinds of things just to attract attention. And it's funny, I remember thinking, Carrie, I'd look over at the card store or I'd look at the jewelry store, or the shoe store, and I think I'm glad I work for Chick-fil-A because everyone's going to eat somewhere today. All I'm going to do is make sure they eat with me. Not everyone's going to buy earrings. Not everyone's going to buy yeah. shoes or cars or ju- cards or jewelry or whatever. And so I said, I'm glad I got my son with this company. But I, I came to believe firmly that sales were controllable. And all I got to do was figure out psychologically how it happened. And, and in a mall, it was impulsive. You try a sample and you come back, you see them, you see, you smell, whatever, and we can get sales up. And so I used that to then, uh, my first job at Chick-fil-A was to become a consultant to our operators to help them put together marketing plans. And so we put together marketing plans and all of a sudden their sales would start to take off and they would start to have confidence that sales were as controllable as cost. And that's really what the ultimate was. So that's a really fresh thought. I'd love for you because it's it's one thing to be 21 years old and squeezing lemons and handing out samples, but obviously you scaled that. You went on to do the cows campaign and you know some of the things that that on a on a national level and now international level, um, Chick Fil A is seen as iconic uh, yeah. about. 
how did you begin to scale that idea that sales yeah. are as controllable as costs? That is a really, honestly, I've, I've done many of these interviews. That's a fresh thought. I don't know that I've heard that before. Maybe everyone else has, but you got me. So <laughs> you keep going, man. Yeah. Well, I, I think you have to decide philosophically on your strategy. And here's an interesting insight for you too. Uh, people love to throw out the word strategy ad nauseum. You know, we mm-hmm. all get sick of hearing that word strategic this and strategic that. Well, I had a business school professor who is one of the greatest uh, professors on strategy, probably in the whole world. And he shared this with me. He said that strategy is about trade-offs. Hmm. You have to trade off one thing for another. And he said, if there is no trade-off, there is no strategy. And if there is no need for a trade-off, there is no need for a strategy. And what I realized with that insight is that people throw out the word strategy and strategic, but most of them are not making stra- are not talking about strategies. They're talking about statements. Hmm. Our strategy is to clean the bathrooms or something. Right. Well, show me the person whose strategy is to keep it dirty. You know, it's like it's got to be a trade-off. And a trade-off means you're sacrificing one thing for another. And really, ultimately, strategies are that way. Hmm. So. Um, so here's the way I think about strategically what our marketing, the, the different, the different trade-offs we make are the difference in our results. So ultimately in most businesses, 80% of what most businesses do is the same as what everyone else does. Like in fast food, we would, you know, Chick-fil-A, 80% of what we do at Chick-fil-A is exactly the same as what our competitors would do. We would buy land, we build buildings. We'd have drive throughs We'd have cash registers. We clean bathrooms. We clean tables. You know, we serve food over a counter. You know, all the things, 80% of what we do, exactly the same as our competitors. On that side of the equation, we just need to be competitive. You know, we just need to do it as well. We need to do it with excellence, but we just need to do it as well as everyone else. 20% of what we do was dramatically different. It was different than what everyone else was doing. That's what created a competitive advantage. And I felt like my job was to figure out the trade-offs we could make that created a competitive advantage. And 80% of what we would do would be the same as everyone else. And we'd be competitive, but 20% would give us this competitive advantage that no one else had because we were making different trade-offs hmm. than other people made. So let me give you, let me. Yeah, that's that was my next question. What were your trade-offs? Yeah. So I think the purpose of a business is to create value for a customer. Now, Interestingly, in business school, I was taught something very different. I was taught the purpose of a business is to increase shareholder value or the purpose of a business is to maximize profitability. So those are all, you know, legitimate ways to approach it. But our trade-off was we didn't think about increasing shareholder value or maximizing profitability. We wanted to create value for a customer, Hmm. uh, which is a trade-off for a lot of people. You know, a lot of businesses are started as what I would call a get-rich scheme. They start a business because they want to get rich. Yep. And so we were competing a lot against a lot of get rich schemes. Uh, so get rich schemes are all about self enrichment. I enrich my life at the expense of yours, you know, and so they're going to enrich their, their life and their bit at the expense of their employees, at the expense of their customers, at the expense of the uh, suppliers. Yep. How many supplier negotiations are win lose and, and, and the uh, win at the expense of the communities that they participate in. So our strategy was the exact opposite. We didn't want to have this win-lose. At the end of the day, if you're a get-rich scheme, you're a win-lose. I want to win. I want you to lose. Our strategy was, we I would label it, we weren't a get-rich scheme. We were a be-rich scheme. We wanted to be rich toward our employees. We wanted to be rich toward our customers. We wanted to be rich toward our suppliers. And I'd love to tell you some stories about that. We want to be rich toward the communities that we serve. And so we had business as a be rich scheme and we were competing against a lot of people who were uh, competing as a get rich scheme. So right there is a big difference. And the get rich scheme, again, the central organizing idea, maximize shareholder value, maximize profitability, which is all about me. Be rich businesses think in terms of how do we create a platform that enriches the lives of all the stakeholders in the business? We didn't think about shareholders. We thought about stakeholders and stakeholders are who are all the people that have a stake in the outcome of the business? Employees have a stake in the outcome. Customers have a stake in the outcome. Suppliers have a stake in the outcome. Uh, Communities and shareholders have a stake in the outcome. 
But if you limit your thinking to one, if the shareholders are winning, but the employees are losing, the customers are losing, the suppliers are losing, communities are losing, guarantee you that is a business that will not last. Hmm. But by contrast, if the employees are winning, the customers are winning, suppliers are winning, communities are winning, guarantee you the shareholders will be winning. Guarantee. That's Chick-fil-A. So this whole value, uh, we, we have a, a little word that we coined called value centricity. It's, uh, it's like electricity, uh, but it's, it's value that, that creates the electricity that runs the business. And value equals what you get divided by what you pay. Value equals what you get divided by what you pay. And what most businesses do is they focus on the what you pay side in order to create more value. Because the, the, the ultimate dilemma for any business and any marketer is that customers want an imbalance in their favor. They want a value imbalance. I want a value imbalance. Correct. Yeah. Want you, you want to say this was worth more than I paid for it. Exactly. So every customer wants a value imbalance in their favor. And the problem is that most businesses aren't very creative, aren't very imaginative, aren't very thoughtful. So the only way they can think of to create that value and balance is to lower the price. And I used to tell Truett, I said, if the best idea I got for you is to lower the price of Chick-fil-A to create that value and balance, a kindergartner could come up with that idea. But it's funny, Kerry. I mean, we all laugh at that. But most of our competitors, that is the best idea they got. It's a race to the bottom. Then you're cheating on your chicken. You're cheating on the bread. You're cheating on how often you clean the bathroom. That is 99 cent sandwiches. Like Hmm. 99 cent sandwiches. Buy one, get one, freeze. All these things. All these, you know, 50% off. That's the best idea they got. And if that's the best idea they got, they ain't got much. But but, but here's why people choose that. It, it, It kind of begs the question. Why do people choose that strategy, that trade-off? Well, it works. You know, literally, if tomorrow Chick-fil-A had a 99-cent sandwich, guarantee you it would work. People would line up to come to Chick-fil-A. Secondly, you can prove to the CEO or the CFO that it did work. You can count, weigh, and measure exactly how many you sold at 99 cents and how many more that was than last year or whatever. So that's another. And it works quickly. I can do it this week and, you know, see it by the end of the month. And so there are all kinds of reasons why people choose that. But the road less chosen and the road that Chick-fil-A chose, our strategy, our our trade-off was we said, you know what? We're not, price is never going to be the way we compete. The way we're going to create the value and balance is not by what they pay, it's by what they get. And we're going to create the value and balance on the what they get side of that equation, not the what they pay. Now, not many people choose that option. Mm -hmm. And you know why? Because it doesn't work immediately. You know, it takes a long time to work. It's not as easy to count, weigh, and measure. You know, almost the opposite of what we just talked about. And you got to have a long-term view on that. But let me share with you, this is what will blow your mind, the result of that over time. Because it's cumulative effect over time. Mm -hmm. Way we competed didn't work overnight. It's the overnight success story, forty years in the making. You know, <laughs> uh, so but here's the amazing thing: Chick Fil A is in the fast food business. You know, last year the average fast food company did about seven hundred thousand dollars in revenue. So fast food is about a seven hundred thousand dollar business. Right. If you're, if you're an individual franchise owner, you mean indi- yeah, individual restaurant. Like yeah. So if I own a restaurant, probably going to gross seven hundred thousand on average. If okay. you look top 200 chains. Gotcha. So that's yeah. the frame of reference. So about a $700,000 business. McDonald's, arguably the best in the business. You know, they're not only golden arches, they are the gold standard of the business. Last year, they did about 2.6 million in a $700,000 business. Wow. That is pretty good. That's really good. Real good. Now, Chick-fil-A is the only one of those top 200 restaurants that I'm aware of that's closed on Sunday. And so we've got a 52 day handicap mm-hmm. and not only is it a 52 day handicap, but arguably it's the worst day of the week to be closed. If you just look at it from a numeric standpoint for most restaurants, their single best day of the week is Sunday mm-hmm. and probably your own behavior, my own behavior. Yeah, lots it's of people like, Oh, out. it's not we'll cooked today. We'll just Sunday. go out. Yeah, exactly. yeah. So Sunday arguably is the best day to be open, but we close, we choose to close. Another strategy, another trade-off. We close. We choose to close on Sunday, arguably the best day to be open from a pure number standpoint. Now, this year, 
Uh, I just talked to Dan Cathy about a week ago about trends at Chick-fil-A in a 700,000 hour business where 2.6 million McDonald's is the gold standard. Take a guess at what the average individual Chick-fil-A restaurant, I'm thinking freestanding restaurants. Mm-hmm. I those right now. The average restaurant will do this year. I'm going to say you out punted McDonald's. So I don't know, 3 million. How about 7 million? Okay. 10 times wow. the norm in 52 less days, 52 less of the best days. 7 million. Hence the triple drive through, hence all the efficiency. Even in the midst of COVID, that's what they're trending to do. It's insane. Isn't that insane? So I, I got to ask you it's because- a strategy. It's a different trade-off. It's a, mm-hmm. it's a be rich scheme versus a get rich scheme. And when the be rich scheme competes with the get rich scheme, it's almost not fair. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to, I want to really, this is fascinating, David. Uh, I'd love to know. So for that, that, you know, you're right. 80% of your business is the same. There's a building, yeah. there's a drive through line. You have employees, you're cooking food. It's quick service, you have bathrooms, the whole deal. Okay. So 80% is the same. You're not racing to the bottom. You're not doing the 49 cent, 99 cent value menu. On the other hand, you can't also charge $18 for a chicken sandwich, right? There's right. there's a top of that that the market will bear. So you're yeah. not undervalued. You're also not overpriced. Yeah. Where does the giving to the customer show up? Where does that value change so that when I pay, I forget what it is, $4 for a sandwich. Let's just pick a number out of the air. I feel like you're over delivering. What are some of the intangible tangibles that you have delivered? Great question. Um well, what we did is we always use going up on price as our last resort. Hmm. Uh, we never wanted to view going up on price as as our first way of kind of increasing uh, uh, our revenues. Right. So what we did is we set a formula that we felt like was a fair profit uh, for the business that we're in. And the only time we go up on price is when our cost structure, we feel like, has permanently gone up. Hmm. So let's say chicken has gone up or right. labor rates have gone up. The only time we ever go up on price. So we've gone, you know, I, I remember times we go two or three years and not take a price increase. Mm-hmm. But what we wanted, Carrie, was the day we took a price increase that we created so much value. And I'm going to get into your specific question. In a minute. We created so much value in favor of the customer that the day we have to go up on price, it's a non-issue in their mind. They're like, because, so 42 cents more, it's not a big deal. Yeah. Yeah. So we wanted to create that value and balance so that when we did have to take a price increase, it's a non-issue in the mind of the customer. And literally, we have this statistic. Early in my career, we could show when we went up on price, you know, we'd see a drop in what we called customer count. Almost like this inverse relationship. Just the raw number of customers. Yeah. But later in my career, as we created this value and balance and really had a better view, you know, understanding of our strategy and execution of it, customer count is identical, if not increasing after we go up on price. I mean, it was just, it was a, a, you know, business miracle in a sense. So let me give you some examples. Um, I wish I could take you. And in fact, I'll give you this offer. If you're ever in Atlanta again. I will be. One day we're going to fly. uh, It used to be called headquarters. We now call it support center. Yes. In the support center, there's an 80,000 square foot innovation center. 80,000 square feet of innovation going on at any point in time. What I'd love to do is walk you through that 80,000 square feet of innovation and show you everything we're working on. But what's amazing is there's not one thing we're working on designed to get you to spend one penny more at Chick-fil-A. Wow. It's all designed to give you more value for the hard-earned money you're already spending with us. So examples. Uh, in order to create value, there are several sources of value. One is pain points. Hmm. Now, the, the pain that you experience in doing business with us, if we can eliminate that pain, we created value for you. So what would that be like wait time like, or wait times? Yeah. Okay. Like drive through, you know, uh, it, there, there was a time, uh, where 50 or 60 cars in an hour was good. Now we got guys doing 300 cars in an hour or whatever, you know, you can get in line and it's like NASCAR, you know, it's like, they, <laughs> and a lot of people, you know, it's interesting. A number of years ago we created, uh, it was in, uh, the, let's see, uh, about 2007 and eight, we had a financial crisis here in the United States, mm-hmm. banking crisis. And during that time, everyone was laying off employees because uh, it was it was a, a time not unlike the one we're going through right now, like with COVID. All of our competitors were laying off employees. And Dan and Truett decided this was the best time to start investing. You know, again, 
trade-off, the opposite. We're going to go on the offense while everyone else is going on defense, trying to save money, save. We're going on the offense. And they decided we're going to create what's now been called second mile service at Chick-fil-A. And second mile service was born during a crisis like this, where they had the crazy idea. We're going to spend millions of dollars to create this program, millions of dollars to train people on millions of dollars to execute in a time we didn't have that kind of money. And it's interesting. uh, You know, there, there was a political candidate years ago here in the United States that had an expression. It's the economy, stupid. Yeah, remember you remember that. that? Well, well, our version of that at Chick-fil-A was it's the food, stupid. The reason come to us, they come to us is for the food. And, and you can make that argument. It's like, mm-hmm. yeah, they're giving us their $4. They get the sandwich. That's why they're here. But Truett and Dan were convinced we could create value way beyond the food. So we started the second mile service initiative. Uh, one of the subsets of the cert- second mile service initiative was the reinvention of the drive through We realized the drive through experience had not been reinvented in 50 years. You know, it was this same thing where you pull up to a box, and it was, <laughs> you know, where you couldn't hear them and they couldn't hear you. And it's this, you know, and so we said, we're going to throw that out, come up with a new experience. And sure enough, now Chick-fil-A is more known for its service and our feedback from customers. They come more for the service than they do the food. Well, and was that when you pioneered like the people coming out to take your order where yeah, you had employees? Exactly. So that's because I thought yeah. that was brilliant and it's been yeah. adapted by others. Yeah. But um, that that's really interesting. What are some of the other hallmarks of second mile service? All right. Uh, well, the, the fundamental concept is uh, we, we believe that uh, at Chick-fil-A, we're not focused on creating sales, mm. we're focused on creating raving fans of the business. And I found that all the great brands, that's kind of their focus. They want to create this uh, group of customers. They're just raving fans of what you do. And we define raving fans as people who do three things. They're happy to pay full price. They come more often and they tell us and others about us. That was our definition of a raving fan. Happy to pay full price, come more often, tell us and others. And the goal was not, it was like, how do we be good enough? to where they're happy to pay full price. You know, you got to be pretty good. I'll bet if I asked you, make me a list of companies you're happy to pay full price. It's a short list. Mm -hmm. Get on the short list with customers. Come more often was important in our business because with a food business, the frequency of business is is really important. But what we thought about it is we want to be good enough to where they want to come more often. Right. And then finally, we wanted to be good enough where they would tell us, meaning if they had feedback, if we gave them a bad experience, they care enough about us to tell us and tell others that they should be eating. You know, so they almost become this uh, unpaid sales force for your company. So if you add those three things up, if you're good enough that they're happy to pay full price, if you're good enough, they want to come more often, and you're good enough, they will tell you when you mess up and they'll tell other people they should eat with you. You've just created uh, something that's almost unimaginable in the world of business. And interestingly, we don't think about it how profitable, but can you imagine any more profitable behaviors a customer could exhibit than those three behaviors? No, I mean, that's a dream. Do. It's not why we do it. Yeah, again, we're not, I don't want to confuse the fruit. That's the fruit, not the object of us doing it. But if we can create that, you'll have the most profitable business in the history of the world which is kind of a $7 million business in a $700,000 category. Yeah. You know? And so, but going back to your original question, the way we are, our plan or strategy to create raving fans was three parts. One was operational excellence. Hmm. Operational excellence is basically giving people what they expect with excellence. Now, most people, they struggle just to do that. So but your sandwich is hot, your fries are crisp, your drink yeah. is cold. Uh, You're not out of ice. You're not running out of product. You're not waiting 10 minutes for your order, all that stuff. And just that is what the business was built on. For a number of years, that's all we had. Hmm. But that was was a pretty good building block right there. But second mile service, if if first mile is about giving them what they want and expect with excellence, second mile is about giving them things they don't expect with excellence. What are all the things people wouldn't expect from a fast food restaurant? I want to give you a good example of that in just a second. And then the third aspect to, to creating raving fans for us was um, what we called emotional connections marketing, that we wanted to develop an emotional connection where they felt like this 
part of the family and, and they felt almost uh, ingratiated and indebted to Chick-fil-A because the way in which Chick-fil-A has impacted their lives and things they care about personally. So we can get into that, but let me give you a tangible example. Yeah. Visiting with a, a operator out in Kansas city one time. And uh, we, we were talking about everything we're talking about. We just watched this video that we produced called every life has a story. And coming out of that, the storyline for me is that if every life has a story, uh, maybe we should make it our business goal to improve the story of those we do business with. That that's one of the central organizing ideas at Chick-fil-A. It's not to make money and profit. It's how do we improve the story of those we do business with? So he and I were we had just watched this film and we were talking about improving the stories of those he did business with. And But then the reality hit us. He said, well, David, all that sounds good. But for instance, I got to compete with 99 cent kids meals. Every one of our, my competitors has a 99 cent kids meal. And if I don't do a 99 cent kids meal, I can't be competitive. And what went through my mind at that point was we don't want, want to be competitive. We're trying to create a competitive advantage. And if all we do is a 99 cent kids meal, yeah, we're competitive, but there was an opportunity to create a competitive advantage. So that day, that particular operator said, you know, I said, if we, if we really do want to improve the story for those we do business with, is a 99 cent kids meal the best idea we got? And we were convinced we could do far better than that. So fortunately for you, fortunately for me, this particular operator had three daughters. And he said, you know, one of the things I love to do is I love to go on daddy-daughter date nights hmm. with my daughters. He said, what about if instead of a 99 cent kids meal, I did a daddy-daughter date night at my store? Well, that, my mind almost exploded at that point. It's like, this is, this is gold. This is pure marketing gold. This is creating value for people in ways. This gives us an unlimited opportunity to create value. So anyway, long story short, he started brainstorming. I started brainstorming. He called me a couple of days later, Kerry. I was back in Atlanta at this point. Mm -hmm. David, you're not going to believe this. I said, what? He said, remember that daddy-daughter date night idea? He said, people from the community have started calling to volunteer to help. And what struck me, Carrie, is, you know, you come from the nonprofit world with the church. People volunteer all the time to help the church. But how often do people yeah, in a for-profit business for -profit to get volunteers? Business? It almost never happens. You know, but a, a, a photographer called, said they'd love to come take pictures. A florist called, they, they said they'd love to donate flowers. A car wash of all things called and said they'd love to uh, come uh, wash the cars of the dads while they were in with their daughters and on and on it went. So anyway, this guy put it on his website. He decided in order to execute it, that he do uh, reservations that night in order to maximize the opportunity because he create 30 minute increments. So in the end, he did the math and he cordoned off three quarters of the restaurant for these dads and their daughters. And he, he did the math and he could create 700 opportunities for dads and daughters to come on this daddy daughter date night between three 30 in the afternoon, nine o'clock that night. And he was going to, so he put it on his website nine in the morning, went back to check at five o'clock that afternoon. This is like two weeks out. Guess what happened? Sold out. Sold out with a waiting list started one day. Now, here's what's fascinating about it. When we, when we did the homework and the research, half the dads didn't even know they had gotten signed up. The moms were signed up. <laughs> <laughs> and the dad got home that night and is like, guess what? You're going on daddy daughter date night in two weeks. And, but here's what I know about a dad. I'm a dad of a daughter myself. And every dad wants to be that. That dad was thrilled. Every dad wants to be that dad. We just have to make it easy on them to live into the dad they want to be. And that's all we did that night was make it easy on a dad to be the dad he already wanted to be. So fast forward to that night. When you arrived at the restaurant, the uh, car wash folks, instead of washing the cars, he decided to have them valet park the car. So you, you'd get out there, they'd open your door, and then he'd set up this big tinted structure and a red carpet. So you'd take your daughter in your arm, walk her down the red carpet. About halfway down the red carpet, there was a big container of carnations. So you'd give your daughter a flower. And then when they got inside, because they had reservations, they set up a hostess stand that night. And it would be Mr. Salyers, Miss Salyers, your table is waiting. And they'd escort you to the table. Now, here's what got super interesting in where this whole philosophy of we're here to create value, not extract value. We're not trying to sell them a 99 cent kids meal. We're trying to create genuine value in their lives. So what this guy had done, he got with a nonprofit in the area to talk about the idea. And they, and they told him, they said, well, the first thing you're going to have is when that dad sits down with the daughter, most dads, when they sit down with their picture in elementary school, middle school daughter, 
He said, there's something that begins with a C that's about to not happen. And I said, what's that? It's a conversation. Yeah. Most dads don't know what to talk to their daughters about. So what he did was he created a placemat with very thoughtful questions for the dad to ask the daughter, like if this nonprofit helped really rich, deep, you know, cool questions to ask the daughter. And then he left the space to record the answer so they could prove to mom that actually had a conversation. <laughs> the same thing for the daughter, you know, this placemat for the daughter with questions to ask the dad and record the answer. Carrie, I've got things like that for my kids when they were young. I've got them yeah. later. You know what that is in my life? It's priceless. It's, you can't put a price on that later on to see my kids in their own little handwriting when they're, you know, in third grade or something, what they were dreaming for their future. He created something priceless for those dads and daughters. Instead of saving them a couple bucks on a kid's meal, he created something priceless in their lives. And so on and on it went, they got their picture made, you know, 30 minutes later out the door, we had, because everyone signed up for reservation, we had their email. So we sent out a survey and I know you're a little bit familiar with surveys and, you know, the, our normal response rate in the world of business, if you get a one or 2% response rate to a survey, you've had a good day. <laughs> you know what the response rate was on that survey? 87%, 87% response rate to that survey because it had impacted their lives so much. They were willing to take time to give you that feedback. You know, we said raving fans tell us and others, mm -hmm. they were willing to tell us about that experience. So I, I couldn't believe it. I said, you got to send those to me. You know, uh, he printed them out and sent them to me. And uh, one of them was three pages long. I sat in my office crying over what this dad said, the impact that it had on his relationship with his daughter. See, that's creating. Well, that's that changing a trajectory. That's changing exactly. a story, right? Bingo. And that's the point. How much value did we create that night for the, and how much value imbalance did we create by allowing a dad to be the father they wanted? You know, we're not in the father daughter business. You know, we're, we're not a nonprofit, but we, that night we were. Mm -hmm. and so the whole idea was hundreds, if not thousands of ideas like that over time and the cumulative effect over time and the emotional connection that's created to our business over time, you know, and what would it now take if that daughter had that special night with her dad, next time they go out to eat, where are they going to want to go? Yeah, it's you know, got a positive association in their mind forever. And then when they grow up and they have their own family, where do they want to go? You know, it's so it's not all about that one night, but that's an example of creating this value imbalance, not by charging less. We charged our normal rates that night, but we created so much more value than what they paid for. They probably would have paid more, mm. but we didn't charge them more. No, you know, I hear you because I totally get that, you know, pricing is can be a race to the bottom. You're just cut, yeah. cut, cut. Uh, sales are co as controllable as cost. That's really good. I want to, let's shift gears a little bit, David. Let's talk about creating value for your um, suppliers or yeah. for your distributors or some of those like B2B people. So your customer, yeah, you've improved their whole experience. You added value on the drive through you created things like the daddy daughter night. You, we've talked on previous episodes with other Chick Fil A executives about even the yes ma'am, yes sir, bringing food to your table. You know, yep. enculturating staff so that it's a positive experience and cutting down wait times. So I think there's lots of ideas for leaders. But I'd love to know how you add value to your partners, to yeah. the people that a customer will never see, but they gave you the chicken, or they gave you the bread, or they gave you the. I don't know, the, the tables for your restaurant. How do, how do you do that? Yes, I, I, I'm, I'm so grateful you asked that question because I think that is a real strategic difference. Mm. I think the way most businesses approach suppliers, they see them almost as the enemy. And it's yeah. a win. How can I and squeeze win something win out of you? Like, how can you give me this for less, David? Exactly. And it's always that. And so you create this win-lose attitude where you're trying to win and they're feeling like the loser or they win and you lose. Right. And there's not much to be gained from a win-lose attitude with a supplier. So what we did is strategically, our trade-off is we said, we're going to do the opposite. Almost like what we just talked about. Instead of arguing over price, let's create value for each other beyond the price we pay with you. And it works both ways. So I'm going to give you right. an example both ways. Yeah, I'd love to hear it. Let me give you an example first. Like Coke was a great example. You know, Coke every year would come to us and, you know, they're going up on the syrup price and, you know, and most people want to haggle over that. And, you know, and it's like, but what we would do is we'd say, let's not argue over the price. 
Let's find ways for you to create value for us well beyond the price. We're happy to pay the price. Hmm. And so I'll give you some examples. Uh, every year we would get together with Coke and we'd come up with a whole list of things that they were going to do for us beyond just sell a syrup because they were so much bigger than us. Right. And they knew a lot more than we did about so many things. So they would help educate us on all kinds of topics. I remember going up, like when we were looking for an ad agency that ended up with us picking the Richards group that ended up with the cow campaign. We never picked a big ad agent. They had lots of experience. So we literally spent time with their chief marketing officer and he walked us through the process that they used and educated us on how to do that and ended up giving us a list of people he would recommend and all these things. It was unbelievable value that they created. I, I got my marketing, you know, master's degree from just talking to their CMO and learning from their, their process. They introduced us to people, et cetera. When we got into sports marketing, Coke had done that for years. We sat down with a person in charge of sports marketing and they educated us on how to approach it and how to think about it. And there, there's a little adage they gave us. I've, I've never forgotten. He said, he said, most people in sports marketing, they want to buy the toy, which was the property. Hmm. Like in our case, we sponsored the Chick-fil-A Peach Bowl. Right. And they focus on just buying the toy, the, the sponsorship. He said, but what you really need to do is buy the battery. To make the toy work, you know, it, it's <laughs> yeah, all yeah, yeah, yeah. No battery, it just sits there. That's the way most people approach sponsorship. So the key is to buy the batteries. And so they literally allocated money to act, what they call activate the event. And so we would a, we would have a disproportionate amount of money to activate the event relative to what we spent. Can you can event. you break that down so we know exactly what that would look like with a real life example? Yeah. Uh, well, let's use the Chick Fil A Peach Bowl. As an example, when we when we first sponsored the Peach Bowl, it was like number 28 down the list. It was one of the most undesirable bowls out there. So it was and gettable and affordable. <laughs> very, affordable very affordable. And it, it was interesting. It was scalable because at that time they had an SEC and an ACC team. Okay. And that geographic footprint matched where a lot of our locations were. Gotcha. So it's very gettable. No one had ever sponsored it before. But both of us got into it and we said our goal is not to buy it, to be the number 28 bowl. Our goal is to get into the uh, college football playoff championship rotation. We want to be a Rose Bowl. We want to be, you know, we're going to buy it cheap and then grow it to make it look like one of these real expensive bowls that we couldn't afford. <laughs> that was our mutual goal. And we literally have done that now. I, I don't know how much you co follow college football, but- Very uh, poorly, we're, but but I, I, I promise you, all my listeners are better educated. So go, go. <laughs> Well, we literally are now part of the college football playoff rotation. So we grew it from number 28 down the list into one of the top six bowls in the country that now rotates. Every three years, we have a college football playoff uh, in the Chick-fil-A Peach Bowl. And then every six years, we have the national championship. You know, although now they've restructured that yet again. So actually now the cities have been on. But the point was, we mutually decided to grow it. So we bought it cheap. But we made investments and they made investments to grow it into something. So, and, and that was with Coke, just to clarify? No, 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 no. That was, uh, there was an independent organization, uh, a nonprofit organization. Oh, gotcha. The, the Peach Bowl Inc. is what it's called. Oh, okay. And uh, so we, you basically I, solved a problem together. How to think about this. Ah. And then we activated. But what we would do is we'd activate it uh, with all kind of uh, ancillary events, like we created a kickoff game. Uh, with the Peach Bowl at the beginning of the season where we said, you know what, there's the end of the season so crowded. Let's do a, a equivalent to a bowl game at the beginning of the season. We created the Chick-fil-A kickoff game. Mm. We had golf tournaments. We had basketball tournaments. We had like a, a fan fest where families could come before the game and enjoy. All these things got layered and built onto that one idea. We even jointly brought the College Football Hall of Fame to Atlanta. It used to be uh, – uh, up in Indiana, and now it's in Atlanta. And that came as a result of us partnering with the Chick-fil-A Peach Bowl. So it just grew into this amazing thing. But our investment we, we did for the long haul stayed really inexpensive because we bought it when it was cheap and we grew it into something valuable. I'd love to even, um, that that is such a great example. If we can, let's go back to the Coke example where you're right, in a classic situation, people are arguing whether it's the cost of paper, the cost of syrup, like, you know, we just need a, that is where almost all negotiation takes place and it's a zero sum game. I win, you lose, or you win and I lose, right? That's That's how it works. So you're like, no, let's not haggle over the price. Let's just talk about how we can add value. 
and you go and sit with the CMO and get a master's degree in mm. um, advertising. How does that work? Because was that an exchange of funds? Was that like, how, how did that work? Well, we built that into the deal. Again, philosophically, our strategy was, you know, value equals what you get divided by what you pay. We uh-huh. said, let's not argue about what we pay. Right. Let's strategize about what we get. So uh-huh. every year we would sit down and we would literally come up with a list of things of ways Coke could add value beyond what we're paying them that they were happy to do. So it would include things like that. It would include uh-huh. things, like even use of their headquarters, you know, their headquarters, is here in Atlanta. We're in Atlanta. So we used to have offsite meetings there. We look for every way that we could create value through that relationship. They would introduce us to people that we needed to meet, that they had relationships with. You know, there are all these ways they could create value above the line instead of just arguing over the price below the line. Right. So right. you walk right. away saying, we don't yeah. care paying X number of dollars it's for always, syrup. It, it's because just add enough above the line. It makes it worth that. Got it. Does that yep. make sense? That makes a lot of sense. From education to activity. Here's another thing we did. We said, let's create a portion of what we pay uh, in in the price of the syrup to be a marketing fund Hmm. that we jointly decide how we're going to spend. So literally every year, if their price went up, the marketing fund went up and we had these joint dollars that we could jointly spend to grow our business in ways that would benefit them and us. So some of the way we even paid for some of the things I just talked about was through that marketing fund we created. So the bigger we got, the bigger that fund became, the more we could do with it. Well, I'll give you a very good example. Yeah. Uh, And I'd love to pick your consultant's brain on this. So uh, (laughs) we we both know Brad Lominick quite well. I'm sure you know Brad. Uh, used to run Catalyst. So Brad works with my team. And, you know, just to take people behind the curtain, this podcast is always brought to you by one or two people. It's one of the reasons I can do the interviews, jump on airplanes, pay for a staff, do show notes, you know, the whole deal. So anyway, it's more than just a hobby now. But uh, one of the things that happened when the pandemic hit was we didn't know where all our sponsors going to be okay, because, you know, it felt like the sky was falling. And and what would that be? And, And his immediate reaction, it was his idea, I give him full credit, was, uh, do a bi-weekly partner call. Just invite all of your partners who are in on this and tell them what you're learning in real time and do like a little mini mastermind. So first of all, I thought nobody was going to come. Secondly, I thought, really, they would want that? Well, that turned out to be one of our favorite things to do. Mm-hmm. in, And we're still doing it, even though the immediate crisis is over. But it was a way of adding value. And we've done that with a couple of other teams where they're like, hey, you know, you got a lot of downloads. Like, can you meet with my team and we'll just sort of swap ideas. You're talking about looking for opportunities like that, that are win-wins. Is that absolutely. it? In fact, absolutely. Kira. That, that reminds me of one that we did. Most of our agencies that we work with in the marketing department viewed all the other agencies as their competitor. Hmm. That's very normal in the yep. industry. So we said, let's reverse that. Let's do the opposite. So every year we would hold an agency summit where all of our agencies got to get together in one place, meet each other, collaborate with each other about, and we said, there's the pie is big enough. You're all getting your fair share of it. Well, let's make the pie bigger and let's collaborate together. You can't believe the reaction we got from the agent. No one else has done that. And they love meeting each other. They love collab. Their ideas got even better when they collaborated with each other. Cause you got a lot of smart people. You got a lot of creative people. And so every year we'd have this agency summit and then quarterly we'd follow up and we would create projects that we were all going to work on. They would all get their fair share coming out of that, but they didn't have to feel like they were competing against the other agencies. They could collaborate with the agencies and then they would just do different pieces of what we came up with. And it was fantastic. But the feedback we would get on that, And here's another thing we would do. We found that a lot of ad agencies don't have a very big budget to develop their people. You know, that that's not a strength in general of marketing agencies. We're going to, we're going to do more to develop them as professionals and as people than their agency is going to do. So we would bring in speakers. We would get them books. We would do, we even took them sometimes. If we would go to a conference, we'd take them with us. We would pay their tuition or their expense to be there. And they would always tell us we're so loyal to Chick-fil-A because Chick-fil-A is investing in our development as a professional in ways our own company's not. <laughs> wow. That's the way we could do it. Where did that, and I know there's not a single answer to this, but, and, and if this is the wrong phrase, you can substitute your own in, but it feels like an abundance mentality. Yes. It really does. Yes. Where did that come from? Was that Truett? Was that a team? 
How did you embed that in your culture? Because everywhere, like we're an hour into this conversation, everywhere I look, it's an abundance mindset, which I'm a huge fan of, but I think we all flirt with scarcity sometimes. Yes. Well, uh, we love that term and okay. we use that term. So I love abundance mentality. Uh, but I would go back to this be rich versus get rich. A get rich scheme in the end of the day is a scarcity mentality. Mm -hmm. It's like enrich. I, I need to win lose because there's only so much pie and I need to get my, I would need to make, get a bigger share. It's a win lose mentality. And abundance mentality is nope. You know, we'll just make the pie bigger and everyone's piece of it gets bigger. And so this whole get rich versus be rich scheme, I think is connected mm -hmm. to abundance versus scarcity. And it really does go back to true it. True it from the very beginning was generous and willing to share with people and had an abundance mentality, right, right down to the way he created the operator model where the operator splits the bottom line with Chick-fil-A of all the profit made in an individual restaurant, 50% goes to the operator, 50% comes back to Chick-fil-A. So for every dollar they make, we make a dollar and it's this unbelievably generous proposition, but he knew that the pie would get bigger. So now we're a $7 million business in a $700,000 category. You know, that's the abundance, mm -hmm. you know? Uh, and so I, I, I love that language. And that's exactly what permeates all these decisions is how do we make a bigger pot? How do we make it better for everyone? How do we create a win, win, win situation, not a win, lose. Right. And so the business is adversarial. It's I want to win. I want you to lose. I got to I got to ask you, because I know there's some leaders who are like, David, I wish I lived in your world. I wish I worked at Chick-fil-A. I wish I worked in one of your companies. You know, I wish I did. But I got this bean counter on my board or I've got this like bean counter on my executive team and they don't think abundance. They think scarcity. They're like, let's cut costs. When you've encountered that attitude, what are what are some ways to kind of flip that or turn that or even quarter turn those naysayers in an organization? Well, um, one of the ways that we would do it is uh, I, we would sometimes have to create what I'll call uh, an oasis of greatness in, an, in a, a desert of scarcity, kind of. <laughs> Maybe an oasis of abundance. I As love that. Or is uh, the ability to do it on a small scale and prove it. Mm. What, what the, uh, the numbers people want is proof. And a lot of times answer. you give it to them. So let's just try it on a small scale, let me show you that it works and then we'll expand it. So instead of going all or nothing where, you know, we have to do, it's like, how can we try this on a small scale? I'll show you that it works. You know, if we given a reasonable amount of time for it to work and stuff, and then if it works, then let's put more into it and do it, you know? And I think that is the, the best way to approach somebody with that scarcity mentality is show them a little bit of abundance. Uh, and, and what that mentality can result in, but not have to go whole hog. I think where people get in trouble is they want whole hog, you know, whole. I'm trying to change your whole hog. life and mindset. Right. So, uh, and, and that almost never works. I, I share with you maybe a, a, a more tangible way to think about it. We were visiting with Jim Collins one time, uh, the author of good to great. Right. Jim was a, he's a fantastic guy is a good friend of Chick-fil-A became a personal friend of mine along the way through Chick-fil-A. And we were out in his office one time. He invited, uh, in fact, this will, this will be an amazing story hmm. for you. That kind of Jim had a, every year he would invite like two or three companies to come visit with him in Boulder, Colorado, which is where he operates out of. And historically you could bring no more than 12 people. And it didn't matter the size of the company or whatever. If you're coming, you got 12 slots and that's it. And so the year he invited Chick-fil-A, we had like 16 people that were on our leadership team. Right. And for the first time in history, uh, he's ever done it. He invited all 16 and his, his secretary, uh, his administrative assistant told me, he said with Chick-fil-A, it just didn't feel right to ask you guys to leave someone behind because you're such a close knit group and you're, and it just didn't feel right. And, and so we asked him, well, why 12? And he said, well, because I only have 12 seats in my little uh, executive boardroom. That was the only reason. So what he did for us is he rented a hotel room so we could do 16. We, we got a hotel room uh, in Boulder and all 16 of us were able to go. But th there was an example where he made an exception to his rule because he said it just didn't feel right given the culture of Chick-fil-A to ask someone to stay home. But here's the, the story I want to share with you. At that time, he was working on his next book. 
and he uh, he had a chapter called Cannon uh, uh, Bullets and Cannonballs. Hmm. And I don't know if you've heard this illustration, but it's so powerful. He said back during the Civil War, when you would go out on a boat, space was very limited. So uh, so cannonballs and gunpowder were quite limited. So he said what they would do is they take a musket and they take a little bit of lead, a little bit of gunpowder, and they'd shoot at the target. And maybe they're 10% off. So they take another shot. Now they're 8% off. Take another shot. Now they're 4% off. And when they finally hit it, then they fire the cannonball. And so they, they're using this little bit of lead, little bit of gunpowder to get to the cannonball. He right. said what most businesses do is the opposite. Someone comes up with a big idea and they want to fire the cannonball immediately. And, they, and then they argue over which cannonball they're going to fire. You know, this multi-million dollar cannonball or this one. So coming out of that, Kerry, the next year when we went to planning, we realized we're that way. We would get in these big arguments over which multi-million dollar initiative we're going to fund. And unfortunately, it usually went not to necessarily the best idea. It went to the person who was the best at selling the idea. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what we decided that year is we said, you know what? Instead of funding one big cannonball, we're going to fund a lot of bullets. So bring us your bullets. And bullets, by definition, are not multi-million dollar. They're these little ideas, a little bit of lead, a little bit of gunpowder. And if it doesn't work, we're not putting the company at risk. It's no big deal. So we fired a bunch of bullets that year. Hmm. Then the next year, we figured out which of those bullets actually were cannonballs, and we funded those. Isn't that a great way to think about That's it? That's a really, first of all, it's a great story. Jim Collins is a dream guest. I'd love to have him on one day. So you're, you're, I, I love his stuff. I would love to know what's one or two of those bullets that in that experimental period, because I think there, this is a time, particularly in all this disruption, David, where there needs to be more bullets and fewer cannonballs. Like we don't know what's going to work moving forward. So gosh, there's so many ways to apply this care, but what, before I answer that question, I just want to, that next year in planning was so much easier because sometimes when we all had our multi-million dollar initiative that we wanted funded and only one got funded and nine didn't, the nine groups that didn't get funded walked away feeling gypped. They felt deflated wow. and all this time. So for the first time, when everyone's bullets got funded, everyone's fired up about going and, and they're committed to making their bullet work. So but let me share with you some examples of what bullets might look like. Uh, maybe a good example would be we all the time had to decide which food product are we going to come up with next. So we would do tons of research and then we might have an initial list of 100 food products and we might get it down to 10 that we would actually take out to an individual restaurant and we would unitize. We'd say, can we really manufacture this? Can we produce it, et cetera? And we do like one location with this one new product. And then maybe the, the list goes from 10 to five, you know, at that point, because it's not as practical to do some of them as others. So then the next step would be, we'd go from one location to like 10 locations and see, could we retrofit it? And then once we got it in 10 locations, we'd go to three markets. We went to three markets. We we're doing a sales test to see mm -hmm. could we fall out of it up to that time. It's more operations test to see, can we do it? And then the sales test would decide which of those products we're actually going to roll out, which one becomes the cannonball. So it starts maybe with 10 bullets, you know, and, and then goes to, you know, the, the ones that are most promising, go to a few locations, then three markets. And then, and only then would it go now. But by the time it goes national, guess what happened between that one unit and three market test? All the problems, all the unforeseen things, although it gets worked out in front of a small audience where it's very fixable, very changeable, very doable. And it turns out, had we rolled out nationally the way we would have done it in one location, almost always would have been a disaster. Right. It's like we don't have supply. This doesn't work. It doesn't taste good. Yeah. yeah. Equipment's not right. All these things. You, you, you kind of bulletproof it. Uh, pardon the pun on that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. There's three more. And then by the time we roll it out nationally, it's never perfect, but it's a whole lot closer. Wow. David, there's going to have to be a part two. This has been so, <laughs> so good. Like, I, I, I absolutely love it. It's been so helpful. I feel like I got my MBA in strategy or marketing or something in this time. Um, you got a new online course. So you retired a couple of years ago from Chick-fil-A. You're running, we were catching up beforehand, 280 companies right now, I think, or something. You got a few on the go, right? 
<laughs> yeah, I got about a dozen different about a dozen different ventures that you're backing right now. Everything from co working space to technology to uh, etc. But you got if people want to access you and your mind, yeah. you've got a course called Spark. Tell us about yeah. that. Yeah, what what Spark is designed to do, Kerry, is uh, a lot of what we talked about today mm-hmm. gets sparked out, but in a much more practical, applicable. Um, well, I've got, I've got a talk I do called remarkable yeah. and the remarkable talk is all about inspiration. What spark is about is the application of that. So let's say people are walking away from this and they're inspired and they want to do what we've talked about. What this course will do is help them apply it. And it's six, six sessions on marketing. I call it, I think about it as marketing branding 101. Okay. We'll dig into everything we just talked about 101. And then it's six sessions on culture. As well, and he, here's an interesting aha for me that that I've kind of learned post Chick Fil A. You know, um, I feel like every great brand understand that ultimately, uh, and, and Donald Miller would talk about this. Yeah. You know, story brand. Every great brand is a story, and the greatest stories become the greatest brands, and the greatest stories add the most value, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But that story has two portals. It's got a customer portal the way a customer sees the story, yes. but it's called an employee story mm. and the way employees see the story. And it's kind of two sides of the same coin. It's the same story, but viewed through the employee's lens and viewed through the customer's lens. Marketing is all about making a great story that the customer sees. Culture is all about making a great story that team members and your employees want to be part of, but it's the same story. And so all what's right. been fascinating about uh, my post Chick-fil-A time is they almost never call me back about marketing, but I get called back almost weekly about culture. Hmm. And I was like, why is this? I wasn't in charge of culture. That wasn't my job description. But everything I thought about from a marketing standpoint, you know, and everything we try to create within the marketing was all culture related. And so I feel like culture is the ultimate competitive advantage, but culture is connected like Siamese twins to your marketing. And they're the same thing. And so if you want to uh, create raving fans, like we talked about before, what I've learned is the customer will never be more excited about your brand than your own employees are. Truth. And if you want to increase the passion, increase the engagement, increase the excitement of your customers, it starts by doing all that with your employees. And the, the level to which you're able to improve that with your employees dictates the level of which you're able to obtain with your customers. So to me, these two are so connected. So the six of these uh, sessions are on brand building. The other six are on culture, kind of the equivalent in culture, because I feel like it's you got to do both. You got to create culture. I've never seen a great brand born out of a terrible culture. You know what I'm saying? You've got to work on the culture to create the great brand. And this addresses both of those. Wow. So where can people learn more? Where can they find yeah. the course? You've got a, an offer, I think, right? Yeah. For- in, in the spirit of what we've been talking about, creating value for people, what I'd love to do for your folks is give them a free sample of what this is all about. And if they like the sample, great. They can dig deeper. If they not, if not, then uh, no harm done. Right. So what they do is they can text spark, the word spark, S P A R K to 55444. If they'll text Spark to 55444, they'll get a free sample of the course. And if they like it, great. And they can, you know, think about doing more. If not, then hopefully at least that portion was beneficial. And interestingly, what they'll get is a uh, a session that I did specifically with this time that we're going through in mind. It's Mm. uh, the upside to the current downside. (laughs) <laughs> it's all about the time we're going through. How do you create upside out of the current downside? That that's the session that they'll oh, get. we all need that. I'll tell you that, David. <laughs> and then you have a website like uh, that people go to generally to find you. All of that. If they'll just text Spark to that number, okay. we'll connect them to all that information. Then we're all set, and we'll link to everything in the show notes, David. There will be a part two. Uh, this has been absolutely fascinating. I don't think I got to a single question I sent you in advance, so that's always a good sign. Yeah. Well, your questions you asked were better than anything uh, that you'd scripted ahead of time. Well, there you go. Those are good conversations. Thank you so much, David. I really appreciate you. And uh, thanks for building into all of our leaders. Pure joy. And it was my pleasure to spend time (laughs) with your listeners. (laughs) That's great. And don't forget to eat more chicken. 
Well, I hope today's episode was helpful to you. You can always get more by subscribing to my channel. I also have a lot more content over at kerryneuhoff.com for leaders in business and leaders in churches. And uh, you can get transcripts of this episode there and so much more, plus some other stuff I do for leaders. So head on over there to discover more at kerryneuhoff.com. And in the meantime, I really hope our time together today has helped you lead like never before.